I'm arguing that social media is good for our society. I believe that social media can be effective in our society by how studies show social networking is used as more than an entertainment, like for jobs, business, and even the military and such uses it. Social networking is used in a positive way and can be effective in schools because students use them in their daily lives, like for things in class and to help them be more attentive in class. For example, more than one in 14 say that social networking sites make them feel less shy, feel less shy by 29 percent and more outgoing to other people by 28 percent. In addition, the majority of teens say that social media helped them connect with friends and family by 69 percent and helped connect with new people by 57 percent. explanation for this debate is to show how social networking isn't as everybody describes ruining the lives of our children as for it's helping them become more successful and able to make positive impact in their generation and society. Um, I'd like to conclude with saying that social media is good for students and teens because 96% of people with interests with internet access using social networking use it in a positive and effective way by helping them become more successful in colleges and in their future. Okay. America, as of 2015, 92% of teens reported going online and using social media on a daily basis. Imagine how much that percentage will increase as years go by. However, this percentage could decrease by showing the world how harmful social media is to our society. According to Cornell University, Stephen Strogad, social media can make it more difficult for everyone to tell apart meaningful relationships and actual world in the casual relationships formed by social media. The impact of social media on our, on our society is very harmful and it leads to addiction of social media and associates more with cyber The first reason social media is harmful to society is addiction. Studies have clearly shown that proportions of the brain that are involved when engaged in social media. Social media engagement has been found to trigger two parts, two key networks in the brain, the mentalization network, network and the reward network. Three hours a day on average is spent on social media for users ages 15 through 19. The most popular place that users check their feed is in the bed with 66% of the users doing that while under the covers. Because of social media, people aren't watching the news as much. 16% of people rely on Twitter and Facebook for their morning news. The reason for this explanation is to disprove the argument of how social networking can help teens and students become more successful in society today. As well as studies show that because of the use of social media networking, more reported car accidents were caused from teens on their phones while driving. Um, not to mention that students tend to be more distracted in class when their grades lower, therefore students are less likely to be more successful at their work. This is all what they call the addiction of social networking and social media and how it's not helpful to students and teens and how it can be more of a distraction than it can be helpful. Uh, therefore, people like to call social media an, an addiction, but if that's true, then why are these next generations becoming so successful in society and future generations? To conclude, I would like to say that my side of the argument is valid because not only do studies prove that prove that social media can be effective and can be helpful to students, not in only schools but in their jobs and etc. But we use social media for more than entertainment. We use this to help us in our daily lives to become more attentive and more productive. In the future, social networking will help us become more productive and more effective in our society. My opponent 
stated that social media is good on our society, but from his point of view, he doesn't realize how bad cyberbullying <coughs> is on social media. Cyberbullies are everywhere on social media. 71.9% reported that they have been cyberbullied once a month or twice in a school year. 19.6 reported once or twice a month. 5.3 reported once or twice a week, and 3.1% reported almost every day. The studies covered a variety of social social sites, but Facebook was the most common. Between 89% and 97.5% of teens who use social media had a Facebook account. 17 of the 36 study analyzed how analyzed look at how common cyberbullying was, and the researchers found that a median of 23% of teens reported being targeted, about 15% reported bullying someone online themselves. 43% of teens said they hate that they have experienced some kind of cyberbullying in the past year. Of teens who use social media, 88% 88 report that they have witnessed someone being mean or cruel to another online, with 12% saying cyberbullying is a frequent occurrence. People should be able to have physician assisted suicide when terminally ill. Stephen Hawking states how I think those who have terminal illness are in great pain should have the right to end their own lives. Five states, Vermont, California, Oregon, Virginia, and New Mexico have assisted suicide legal. One in six states, Americans live in a state where a doctor can prescribe a lethal dose of drugs to a patient. Euthanasia should be allowed because if somebody is terminally ill and suffering, or if they choose, if they want to die with dignity. Patients that are ill should have the right to die. Terminally ill patients should have the right to should have the right to choose if they want to die with dignity, with the peaceful, painless death, so the patient and their families don't have to see them suffer. First reason she should be legal is the right to refuse treatment is recognized as a fundamental, fundamental principle of liberty. So patients should be able to request medical interventions that should, can result directly in death too. Another reason terminally ill patients have the right to die is the Hippocratic Oath, which is the oath stating the obligations and proper conduct of doctors. One of the statements in it are do not harm. Euthanasia being illegal violates this oath by letting the patient suffer, therefore harming the patient. The third reason is CNN tells, a, tells about a 29 year old girl named Brittany Maynard to diagnose with a stage 4 brain tumor and, and it was told that she had six months to live and now on November 1st, 2014, she took her own life with a pill. She died peacefully, surrounded by a loving family and her own. Instead of losing her battle, battle of cancer on a co-hospital bed of pain. Right. Right. Benefits from this. Where other areas could supplement and even transcend life's boundaries, this simply wastes possibility. The only thing assisted suicide can provide and support is death. Life is a beautiful thing. We're born one moment and taken away another, but there's so much that can go between those moments. Such a matter like this can rip out. You can return from dust. We can rise from ash, like a phoenix. A cure could be found, love could be had. Alas, not is the release from death. It's a cold grip whose vice none will find freed. An area of regret shall go unending from the hearts of the grief-stricken, and warmth won't be felt with the frigid knowing that there was a gate open too late. A life closes without feeling the clutch of purpose or honor. It's greeted only by cowardice and dark, but the black would always hold. Finally, a glimpse of hope. A gravely ill beloved suffers without relief, but their family wishes perseverance. Soon, the answer to their ailment is revealed. This could be a reality, yet we're so quick to welcome death.
Physician-assisted suicide puts people in a weak state into an endangered state, which ruins the relationship between a doctor and patient, violating a bond held for millennia. Assisted suicide compromises the family of the beloved and can drive them to a fish and bring about a damaged state. Euthanasia. Okay. Some might argue that there still might be a chance for someone with a chronic illness to survive it. But it's not fair to the suffering patient to let them sit there in that helpless state until their inevitable death. So. simply look for another answer, even if it's not already written. Shouldn't that be their duty? In what way is it okay for somebody to have a piece of paper or a document that says that they are allowed to end another's life with <clears throat> somebody's signature, writing it off and saying it's okay? shootings have occurred and the death toll is uncalled for. Sandy Hook, Columbine, and Lyndhurst are just some of these examples, and all of them have something in common, deaths that could have been prevented. We believe that if teachers are trained and armed, they could defuse school problems more efficiently, and if they're willing to hold the gun. The first reason is teachers should be able to carry a gun in, during school hours if they're willing and um, properly trained to carry a gun. They should not be forced to if they don't want to. And denying this privilege to carry a gun during school is just stopping the law-abiding people from it and en en enabling the, uh, the people willing to do bad things to take advantage of these people they are following the law. By disabling someone to protect themselves, you are enabling people who wish to harm an easier passageway with less problems. If a teacher sees fit, take the steps to become trained in carrying a gun, they'll know the responsibilities so they can take them in their own hands and protect children and their own lives. Teachers should be able uh, to carry a gun in school because of school shootings. In hostage scenarios, law enforcement standoffs can occur and law enforcement, if they can't get there quick enough, then they can take matters in their own hands and protect lives and save lives. A teacher with a firearm is clearly much more protected than one without, and so is the class that he or she is over. So all of, in a in whole, a school would be a much safer place if the faculty were trained and willing to possess a firearm and um, being able to defuse a situation before law enforcement could even get there. In the Sandy Hook shooting, two teachers went into the hallway to investigate and only one returned. Imagine how differently that would have played out if the teachers were armed. When most teachers go to college to earn their degree, the focus is on how to best educate students. A teacher would learn all the skills necessary to show, how stu to show students how to complete their educational requirements. However, our society has turned the teacher into a protector and not just an educator. 4% of school shootings happen at schools and educational facilities. This small number of incidents would not be prevented by teachers having firearms. The first reason that teachers should not carry firearms is because they are not trained law enforcement officers. Students are at significant risk when teachers carry firearms because of their lack of training, lack of preparation for situations, and their lack of control. According to the Huffington Post, many kids, especially boys, 
learn to handle their problems with their hands and on their minds. By allowing teachers to carry firearms, students would be more likely to get their hands on a firearm. If teachers were not allowed to carry firearms, students would not have the access to them. Allowing teachers to carry firearms is dangerous to the school environment, distracting to the goal of education, and frightening for students. According to thinkprocess.org, an armed teacher would be able to protect students from a gun list. If all went well, this would be the ideal. However, all of the risks would outweigh this one benefit. Some may argue the side that teachers should be allowed to carry firearms on the school campus with a permit, but this makes the teacher responsible for carrying, for carrying firearms and protecting all students. This makes the process redundant of having a school resource officer on campus at all times, just as every school has. It is clear that teachers should not be permitted to have access to firearms. Essentially, teachers carrying weapons in school would be trouble for everyone in the school, including themselves. One wrong move could cause the loss of an innocent child's life. Some may believe that more guns on a school campus is bad. However, we believe that by stripping the Second Amendment from good law-abiding individuals, you're merely clearing a path for unlawful citizens to carry out what they're wanting to do. By punishing the innocent for a hip hypothetical scenario that could play out, um, we're not taking the preventative steps that we could be using to stop potential threats to the classroom. In conclusion, if a teacher or administrator so wishes to carry a firearm with proper training, I see a much larger horizon for good to come out of this situation than bad. In a school campus, the campus can be more better protected if prepared to face dangers like school shootings. If employees are properly evaluated and trained to use a firearm, the amount of time that the shooters are putting fear and killing in schools is uncalled for. By putting arms in teachers, it, it makes up for time that EMTs or police officers or fire departments just emergency could get there and they could just take it into their own hands and basically just save more lives than wasting the time for other people to get there and help. Evil will be here forever, so why ignore this problem when we could be taking steps to solve it? We can't just ignore it and it go away. Very good. Very good. Death cannot be controlled. Arming teachers would not be necessary because of the armed people we already have. If teachers were able to protect the students, this would be ideal, but all the risks would outweigh one benefit. In conclusion, guns should not be allowed at school to prevent distraction, danger, and fear. Firearms on school campuses are a bad idea because it does not make kids safer. It makes the situation more dangerous because if something happens, then more bullets would be flying. No matter what, you can't stop people from getting guns even if they're not supposed to have them. Teachers should not be able to carry firearms in school. No matter the training you go through or how you will, you don't know how you will react to the situation of having to pull a firearm out during school. Our president says that he recommends people should take advantage of the Second Amendment, but school teachers and staff do not need to carry firearms because it's not their role at their job because we have SROs for a reason. Just because a teacher has a gun does not mean that they can stop a school shooting because what if there's more bad guys than good guys in that school? And in a situation that's high stress, nobody's gonna remember their training. They're just gonna do their first instinct. Which more than likely would not go back to their training. They will just freak out. To the flag and soldiers and our country. If you kneel during the national anthem, you should be suspended and not be able to play that game. It started off with one guy kneeling for the national anthem. Now several teams are doing it as a whole.
1996, Muhammad Abdul Rauf, the point guard for the Denver Nuggets, once said, I do not criticize those who stand for the national anthem, so why am I criticized for not? How is it acceptable to show this kind of disrespect to another human being and not say there's a need to be called for change? Not standing for the national anthem is a legal form of peaceful protest, which is a First Amendment right. Therefore saying it is not disrespectful. Um, a letter signed by 35 US veterans stated that kneeling is far from disrespecting our troops and that there is no finer form of appreciation for their sacrifice than for Americans to enthusiastically exercise their freedom of speech. Refusing to stand is a way for athletes to say that something needs to be done in America. The 49ers quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, said that he was not going to stand to show pride for a flag, pride in a flag for a country that opposes black people and people of color. In conclusion, the professional athletes who are kneeling aren't kneeling out of disrespect for their country. They're kneeling because they've been put on a platform where people will listen to them when they say there needs to be change. Of people, individuals are just inferring that they're t he's talking about them and not standing for the national anthem. They would not play the national anthem for you to kneel during it. It's for respect for our country and our soldiers. So you need to stand during it. My opponent stated that you stated multiple times that not standing is disrespectful, which is something that our president has said. Did you know it says in the United States Code of Conduct, a flag should never be worn as wearing apparel, bedding, or drapery, which would include Make America Great Again hats with the American flag on it. MAGA caps worn by many Trump supporters. This states, I started at the wrong place. This states that it's actually more disrespectful to wear American flag clothes than it is to kneel during the national anthem. Because it's not disrespectful to kneel during the national anthem. Thank you. Companies should test their products on animals because animal testing contributes to many life-saving cures. We share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees and mice are 98% genetically similar to humans, so they are a susceptible alternative for people. If vaccines were not tested on animals, million, millions of them would have died from diseases such as rabies, distemper, and feline leukemia. It has even saved endangered, endangered species from extinction. Animal testing has also helped scientists discover innovative ways to treat and cure illnesses in people including AIDS, cancer, and asthma. Scientists have been able to increase their knowledge of animal health, human health, and disease by studying animals. For example, antibiotics, insulin, vaccines, organ transplants, and HIV treatments have all been developed with the help of experience involving animals. Research using animals have contributed 70% of Nobel Prizes for biology or medicine. Animals play a small but vital role in medical research. That brings hope to several people with conditions such as cancer, heart failure, Animals 
not have rights, therefore it's acceptable to experiment on them. Animals do not have the ability or moral judgment that humans do. If we granted animals, all humans would have to become vegetarians and hunting would be outlawed. So therefore it is acceptable to research on them. Okay. The topic is companies, should companies test on animals? I don't think they should because companies, we are arguing for the side that there doesn't need to be animal testing for all drugs and that it isn't needed and there are alternatives and that there are times it hasn't worked and it is painful for the animals. Traditional animal testing is expensive, time consuming, uses a lot of animals and from a scientific perspective, those oats do not necessarily translate to humans. Dr. Christopher P. Austin, director of the National Institutes of Health Chemistry Genomics Center. Animal testing has been around since the 19th century. There has been no documentary of when it first started because they do not care about the animals they test on. Um, and, um, animal testing and animal ingredients have found a way to premature a large portion of products on the market, whether the products is for cosmetic uh, purposes, cleaning, and uh, of uh, beauty products. There is an animal history of all animals suffering just because of people wanting. The good thing is that people are finding to understand for animals not to be tested on. My claim is that it is ineffective and there are alternatives. My, one of the alternatives is microdosing, which puts experimental studies back into the bodies of human volunteers. It uses doses too small to create a pharmacological effect or an adverse reaction. Currently, nine out of 10 experimental drugs fall in clinical studies because we cannot accurately predict how they, will, how they will behave in people based on laboratory and animal studies. Yes, it is, it is harm, harmful for the animals but it also benefits for the animals and humans for new cures for the disease, diseases. Mm, it, you, yes, also it uses a lot of animals, but they also save a lot of lives. And animal from the fruit fly to the mouse are widely used in scientific research for, for, a, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of, <laughs> I can't, sorry, for a lot of research, for all the benefits, um, <laughs> that's it. Thank you. said that the chimpanzees are 99% uh, as like us, but they're not 100%, so they could still fail. That 1% is still enough to, for a uh, chemical to fail. Also, in one study, they used a poor little rabbit to see how long it would take for a chemical to burn its eye off. As a matter of fact, every year, uh, millions of animals are killed in a cruel way, like poison or snapping their neck, just to outdate a test to evaluate how hazardous of consumer products. They just use them to test on them and then just kill them. They never get a right to be free. And, she, and my opponent also said that um, it helps the animals. Nothing is helping the animals. You are just killing them by adding more poison to them and chemicals. In conclusion, after this information, do you still think companies should still be allowed to keep testing animals like this? It's inhumane, dangerous, and it's clearly not safe.
Making your school gun free is only to soften the people who are law abiding and being followers. In 2002, law school shootings stopped gun men were confronted by student care. Earl, Mississippi, advisor principal took a point forty five from his truck and ran to the scene where the intruder fled the scene. A teacher would have access to the firearms at all times, and if one went crazy, could cause adverse issues. Someone could say some, someone could say the above about a teacher using the firearm for situations it is not intended for. The argument, too, that is how many teachers have gone crazy and pulled a gun out in school to kill a mass number of people. If there are teachers carrying firearms in schools, it would decrease the chances of anyone coming into the school armed to kill. On April 20th, 1999, two teenagers began to shoot up Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. With their crazy shooting spree, they killed 13 people, injured over 20 others. After their deadly attack, they shot themselves and died. With the presence of guns in schools, this horrible act could happen more frequently. Handguns should not be allowed in schools. In case a teacher or a student was mentally unstable, they could also take a gun and try to shoot up their own school. If there were handguns in schools, then a student with a mental illness or, emotional, or emotionally unstable could get a hold of the gun and potentially shoot up the school. This is also the same for a teacher. If a teacher is emotionally unstable, then if he or she had a gun, then he or she could potentially shoot up the school as well. 122 school shootings since Sandy Hook happened. Uh, of those, there were 12 accidental shootings, 97 assaults, 11 mass shootings, and 12 suicides. Most of these shootings were five females ages 17 to 46, and 107 males ages 5 to 62. These ages start really young. The age 5 through 18 are the years that you're in school through high school. And so if a child or a teacher were to get a gun, they could potentially um, shoot up a school. The Second Amendment states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nowhere in that amendment states that handguns should be allowed.
Guns offer security and protection for students. As long as the carrier of a firearm is trained and permitted with the proper safety courses, then everything's okay. Also, if a teacher is emotionally unstable, then why are they teaching? Suicide is your own choice. People might say mentally ill people with a death sentence or suicide admission per se would still come into the building in hopes and that they would be killed. Fact being that there are less mentally ill people shooting up schools than there are sane people walking into a school every day, so why not let teachers protect our schools in a way that would ensure that every individual is safe? As a result, cops cannot be in room everywhere at all times, and it is a fact that it is less likely that someone will target an area that is armed than one that is not armed with signs that have that are fully armed for protection. Having more guns would ensure less violence as there are more sane, law-abiding people walking into schools every day than there are not. There will be skeptics that will state that, that this will cause more people to become curious or feel more empowered by using or having these firearms attached to them. But that statement goes back to the teachers having to first be trained, permitted, and have special psychiatric evaluations done to be able to carry around the children. Also, a claim that might arise would be that if it will not make the kids feel safer, kids are young and really don't know what truly makes them safe. We need to actually be safe, safe than rather just feel safe. Lastly, a teacher caring to make that the case. <laughs> Carrying a concealed handgun increases the chances of confrontation escalating and turning into lethal. Teachers and students cannot be trusted in the workspace with a concealed weapon. Who knows who may get a hold of the gun? A couple of years back, there was a retired police officer with a legally concealed handgun. He ended up shooting and killing another man during a movie over texting. If a trained, retired officer can't control himself with a handgun, then how can you trust a trained teacher with a gun? In 2017, Julius Willis threatened to shoot up a culinary arts department in Tri-County uh, High School in Franklin, Massachusetts. Uh, Willis did not like the culinary arts director, so he made threats on social media about how he was gonna shoot up the school. Um, in the debate that our opponents brought up, they started talking about how it is less likely for a school with guns to be, it is less likely for a school with guns to be shot up. But if you, for example, were to come into a school knowing that there were guns, then you would most likely bring your own. So that being, there would be more guns involved and potentially more people hurt and injured. Don't have guns in schools. Imagine you're sitting in a doctor's office. You woke up in a panic this morning because of a bullet you found on your skin. The doctor walks in and gives you the exact news you didn't want to hear. You've been diagnosed with melanoma, a particularly lethal type of skin cancer. However, all hope is not lost. With the research involved in human cloning, the cure for and prevention of any particular genetic disease, such as melanoma or other types of cancer, is very much within reach. With the patient's stem cells, replacement cells can be made to replace the affected area of your body and cure you. 
The restrictions put upon clothing and cloning and its research should be uplifted because of its ability to cure many genetic diseases such as cancer and melanoma. To start with the knowledge given us today, human cloning has otherworldly an otherworldly amount of potential and promise in improving our quality of life. But this promise is overshadowed by the by denial of research and practice in these procedures. <clears throat> Firstly, therapeutic cloning is used in procedures that are practiced today and have been shown to treat neurological problems like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's, repair hearts, produce insulin for diabetes, and replace any kind of living cell that has been injured or otherwise dysfunctional. Despite these promises, the, the USA has been limited in its cloning-related discoveries because, according to the National Conference of State Legislators, only 31 states have addressed the cloning practice, with only eight of which accept in cloning research. Therefore, we lack the documented negative information to justify an appropriate ban over cloning. The second reason for the allowance of cloning is that cloning, both reproductive and therapeutic, can cure such heinous diseases as Parkinson's disease as well as Alzheimer's. Uh, for example, on June 9, 2011, doctors in London implanted a synthetic trachea into a 36-year-old man with late-stage tracheal cancer, curing his cancer. In conclusion, allowing the research of cloning would immensely improve the overall health of society and save many lives. What is the price for perfection? How far are you willing to go for immunity? Perfection is striven for by all people, but are hundreds of deaths worth it? Are disease-stricken test subjects the cost? Human cloning is not only dangerous to the clones and others, it is also ethically irresponsible and unreasonable, thus should stay illegal. Whenever cloning is mentioned, most people will know that it's wrong, but they don't know why, and this is because morally they know that the recreation of an individual is wrong. It violates the right to have a unique identity and the right to ignore your future, to have an open future. The clone might feel excessive pressure to reach the high standards that have been set by the, ho excuse me, the host or the original. The freedom may be substantially diminished and the clone may then have psychological distress. How would you feel if somebody else had already gone through and made decisions? The clone would may, may feel contained to these decisions. Human cloning would also diminish the value that we place on and therefore our respect for human life because it would lead persons to being viewed as replaceable. Because you would, with human cloning, you would be allowed to recreate a loved one or a historical figure. But this clone will be different in many aspects to the original, as its personality and its environment will have changed from before. Some may disagree, claiming that ethically, human cloning is entirely reasonable and that overall, the end defines the means. This means being curing medical diseases and saving a nation. But the ends to obtaining these means involve death rates over 93%. Overall, human cloning is a violation to a person's individuality and can psychologically damage the clone themselves. Human lives would mean less. How does that improve a nation? Human cloning is too much of a risk to all participants. The rate of success is only 0.1% to 3%, leaving all persons too vulnerable to an experiment that is too idealistic and immoral to be reasonable. Cloning diminishes, diminishes the value of human life and can hurt the clone psychologically. These are the prizes for perfection and immunity.
Perfection is unachievable. Um, striving to be perfect is impossible. And we can definitely improve ourselves, and that's not an unethical goal to achieve. Uh, everyone wants to improve, and as long as we can improve, we will be better, and in no way is that wrong. She brought up the fact that how uh, clones would be different to the original, and simultaneously claiming that it would be an infringement on identity to fuck. So it would be a different thing, but it would overtake your identity. <clears throat> you, you claimed the rate of success was 1.1 1, 1. 1 to 3 percent, and there weren't really any specific uh, boundaries made about what success was. 93 percent death rate uh, to what? Uh, as of now, there has only been one instance of human cloning, and that was in 2004 by Shukrat Metalipov in Russia. She also claimed that uh, cloning would be unreasonable because of uh, how it would apparently infringe on the right to identity. However, uh, it, it would actually be completely reasonable because of how it would cure many genetic diseases and very <laughs> what? That was a terrible oh, recall. Oh, I don't have hope for that. I have so many things to say. <laughs> this is why you're doing it. You're wrong. Which sounds negative and affirmative? Negative. It's taken a little bit. Okay, well, I mean, I just they said, listen, they said, I'm listen. not emotional. <laughs> Of the worldly, if, imagine. These were all you words used in our opponent's debate. The success rate is less than 5%, and the success rate being that they survived the cloning and things actually turned out decently okay. There were 276 failures, meaning deaths, before Dolly the Sheep even happened. And she had premature arthritis, a lung disease, and died at a very early age. They mentioned genetic mutations curing the diseases that they discovered. These, so far, have been far worse than what they were originally, meaning that we're just going to make other people's worse than what they already are. And this is a uh, human cloning debate, not a body parts debate. De de debate, sorry. <laughs> So when they say that they're creating an entire body and then just using certain organs, we're making a body farm, and that itself is repulsive, which is why we should not have cloning if we're just going to use individual parts. No. And then John Berger once said, without ethics, man has no future. This is to say, mankind without them cannot be itself. Ethics determine choices and actions and suggest difficult priorities. That's all. Thank you. Don't be up there. Don't be up there. It was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer called glioblastoma, which is very aggressive. Brittany had limited time to live. The tumor had her brain from this disease was so large, Brittany would have required a full brain radiation. The brain radiation would have burned all of her hair off her scalp and caused the worst of burns. Maynard would have been pretty much bedridden with great suffering. There was no treatment that could save her life. Thought of, thought of going into this trial of, of pain only to meet her in caused Brittany to rethink the situation. Brittany and her family decided that physician-assisted suicide was the best option. Brittany passed away peacefully in, in her home in Portland, Oregon with no suffering and no pain. Now, put yourself in her shoes. Would you rather go through the greatest of pain and the greatest of suffering, or go out peacefully through physician-assisted suicide with your dignity fully intact? Brittany Maynard wanted to go out peacefully instead of going through the rough struggle that would 
result in death anyways. She didn't want her family to see her suffer in hospice care till she reached her end. Brittany received a prescription from a physician that she self-ingested into herself to end her dying process. Physician-assisted suicide should be a lawful medical procedure for competent, terminally ill adults because it is a compassionate response to relieve the suffering of dying patients. Advocates of assisted suicide laws believe that mentally competent people who are suffering and have no chance of long-term survival should have the right to die when and if they choose because there are more benefits of helping terminally ill patients who request to die than non-beneficial outcomes. Examples of these include helping terminally ill patients that request to die will free up medical funds to help other patients that have a chance at living, Helping terminally ill patients that request to die by physician-assisted death will improve care and comfort qualities at the end of life, and also vital organs can be saved and used to save other patients. ABCnews.com that I pretty much got a letter in the mail today that said, if you want to take the pills, we will help you get that from the doctor and watch you die, but we won't give you the medication to live. Physician-assisted suicide is a public, public act that requires medicine law and society approval, a lethal prescription that crosses the line between caring and killing. It should not be legal because of financial incentive for premature death, and it goes against the Hippocratic Oath. Hippocratic Oath is an oath that is sworn by all doctors to make sure that on a single doctor will diagnose a deadly uh, medicine. And with that note, with that law, the uh, physician suicide, this is suicide, that will break their oath they are sworn to take when they become a doctor. That oath is the one that helps the patient trust the doctor that they are always in their care and always there to try to make sure they Will survive there's any disease. Physician assisted suicide should also be illegal because it provides financial incentive for premature death. This can put stress on the patient for inheritances and can cause major discrepancies in court. Barbara Wagner, an Oregon resident, was very sick and under the Oregon health care plan. Ms. Wagner reported that she was in non-chemotherapy but offered physician assisted suicide under an Oregon court of law. So she either gets to choose premature death or just wait out her final day. Hang on. Hang on. 
There's no way. Okay, so opponents say that it's against the doctor's oath and like it's not the doctor's it's not it's not the doctor's choice because like they, opponents may say that, that that such laws devalue human life, but if people have the right to refuse the life-saving treatments that doctors offer them, the patients with mental illness or diseases should have the freedom to choose to end their own lives. If it's the patient's choice, it should be their choice. The doctor should have a say in anything, because the patients they're they're suffering. And they don't want to go through this or put their families through this. So it's their choice. This should be their choice. In conclusion, physician assisted suicide should be illegal for competent terminally ill adults because it is a compassionate response to relieve the suffering of dying patients. Take Brittany Maynard for example. She is a 29 year old woman who was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. There were no treatments that could save her life. She didn't want to put her and her family through the struggle and suffering of being in hospice care until she met her end. Not, not to mention that this ALS patient named Christina Simmons, who didn't want to put her family through the horror of ALS symptoms. That wouldn't allow her to walk, talk, transfer, or even be able to swallow or feed herself. The only thing she'd be able to move before her death is her eyeballs. Can you imagine, can you imagine not being able to kiss your kids goodnight before you meet your end? Can you imagine the dignity that would be lost? This is why physician assisted suicide should be a legal medical procedure for terminally ill adults. It's a highly compassionate way to relieve them. Brittany Maynard may have suffered a lot, may have had a bad illness, but the doctors are under the Hippocratic Oath and they still can't break something if they're under oath. The president and a lot of other people are under an oath and they can't break their oath. <coughs> the top Vatican official condemned her right to die campaign. This also causes a lot of religious turmoil among several groups all throughout the world. Others may say that it's their choice if they would want to commit suicide or not. Well, even if the patient decides to choose physician-assisted suicide, they would have to wait two days before it even will happen. Well, just think of that. You have two days to think for your life's pressure on. Is that a lot of time? Well, some of y'all may say, yeah, it's a lot of time, but think. How many days 
could he live? That's a good thing. Would he live two days, which is guaranteed, or will you live where you can live long enough for them to find the cure for your disease? Now you say, how that happen? There is scientific enhancements. Every day, help you find the disease. You may be able to live long enough to make sure you find every cure for that disease so you'll live probably the rest of your life if you're hell. Yeah. In conclusion, we believe that physician assisted suicide should not be legal for humane and logical reasons. The first reason being that it breaks the Hippocratic Oath, the second being that it causes financial turmoil. From a mathematical standpoint, you have a 1 in 400 trillion chance of being born. If you were blessed with such a great opportunity, why would you want to waste it? Why would you not want to spend those last few moments you have with your family and make things right among everybody that you've ever known? Good. Yeah. 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 In the most, in the not so near future where everything is safe. Some of the people work at the factory overseeing AI manufacturing. Every human overseeing the AI in this large factory makes sure everything is the perfect quality. Ever since AI has taken over the labor workforce, manufacturing rate has greatly increased and there has been lower rates of harm. In the current day and age, technology has advanced greatly in the only a few decades. It is still advancing at a great rate. And a large, con um, a large topic of controversy has appeared. This controversy is the development of a or is is the development of artificial intelligence, and if it shall if it shall be continued or should it be stopped, many people disagree on this topic and what is the correct choice of actions. The development of AI shall be should be continued as humans will benefit from their assistance. I stand for the AI development because major positive impact on human society would happen since AI has more positives than negatives when working in the workforce. AI is an alternative, is a better alternative to humans in the workforce. For example, is what SCEstack.org reasons on why AI, why AI are, are superior. AI is cost efficient since it costs a good amount when you start off, but in the overall, they don't have to pay them monthly. And AI have another reason from SCEstack.org is AI has no emotional barriers which can stop people, which can stop humans from being, being stopped because they're tired or they don't want, or they're having emotional problems in their life. AI is currently developing, is currently developed as narrow AI that is designed to do one simple task. However, the long-term goal of many researchers is to create general AI, which is AI that can do multiple tasks than a, like a human worker, but it could be even better. Imagine John. John is a middle class citizen. He finds nothing more joyful than doing his job and making his way. He is the heart of American society. And one day, he walks in, November 3rd, he walks in, his job is taken. Because of artificial intelligence, a new machine has taken his line on the sewing factory line of salt. Now he can no longer make his socks. A machine is doing it for him. Yes, production rates go down. Yes, no one can take away his joy, but this machine has. Okay, AI not only is taking jobs, but there are over 20 million cyber attacks each day and that does not include personal or business cyber attacks. So you have one main AI machine that knows all of this knowledge. That just gives one big target for everyone to put their um, knowledge to, to try to control this. No matter how hard we try, the human brain will evolve faster than this computer will. We will find new ways to hack this computer and all the knowledge and time you put in this is just going to end up hurting people. We 
when taking away the middle class, society's fall. When taking away and relying on one thing, society's fall. Whenever people can't find work, they rely on a thing that they never thought they would rely on. clothing but that's that's not that could not be the point that could not be true some people of us some people like my colleagues believe that AI will ruin the job economy and take jobs from the common people but information from futureoflife.org tells us that these conver these controversies are causing leading experts to disagree people that are working on AI and trying to figure out what it shot what it could do to the world and AI is too hackable that could not, that's probably not the truth, because other of a, because AI researchers at the 2015 Puerto Rico conferences guessed they would take, it would happen before 2016, because it, 2060, because it may take decades to complete the required safety research, which shows a top priority of the researchers is AI safety, and that they will take decades to make sure it is safe to the public. Let's see. In conclusion, AI should be developed to a higher degree because it is cost efficient, has no emotional barriers, and will be tested for, se tested for safety for decades before AI is released worldwide and for public and public mass to use. Our opponent here was talking about how much time it's going to take to make this. That's a lot of money and time. And we, can, we have been making more and more advanced computer viruses as years go on. So if you say it's going to take 40 years to make AI safe, in 40 years there's going to be more viruses. There's going to be more ways to attack this. It's not always going to be. We solved this one way. They're not going to make another way to attack this. It's impossible. And statistics show that 40% of American jobs are at risk to AI. How, if you make something a buck cheaper because you're using AI, then if somebody doesn't have a job to buy your product, then what's the use of making it a buck cheaper? In modern times, we don't seem to think about things as viruses, 
We may see computer viruses as things that just ruin our computers. But the reality is, is it goes back to the Black Death. They had one way of getting food and supplies, and that was by boats coming in from other countries. That's how it spread. That's how it comes. And whenever you do something over and over again, as Albert Einstein said, that's called insanity. Why would you try to rely on something that isn't? Alright, make sure you vote, please. Who won? Uh -huh. Wait, Wait. 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 Wait.